Welcome back, lovers and haters of Earth science. Today, we're gonna be continuing our journey through the universe. And since we left off talking about celestial observations, we might as well talk about all the ways that Earth moves through space without us even knowing about it. So, before we all get motion sickness, let's get into this video. So, believe it or not, we're hurling through an endless space at thousands of miles an hour in multiple directions. And the most amazing part about this is we don't feel like this. Now, some of you are probably wondering, why don't we feel any of these motions? And it's kind of similar to riding in a car. When all the windows are up and we're driving 60 miles an hour, it doesn't feel like we're going 60 miles an hour. And our atmosphere works very similarly to those windows in the car. And the only thing that would really turn up our day is if one of these motions of Earth just suddenly stopped. But let's not get into hypotheticals. Instead, let's focus on how our understanding of Earth's motions has changed over time. So, in our last video, I mentioned that it would be logical to think that we're not moving and everything is moving around us. And this is because we don't actually feel the motions of Earth. And for a long part of Earth's history, this is how we organized the universe. We used what was called the geocentric model. And this was used by famous philosophers such as Aristotle and Ptolemy. And what the geocentric model is, is Earth is a stationary object in the center of the universe and everything revolves around it. And this is what that might look like. Now, this helped us to explain our surroundings, but there was a problem. Some of the planetary motions were so strange that they couldn't be explained. But, lucky for us, in the late 1500s and early 1600s, the invention of the telescope, along with a few bright fellows, Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler, helped us to develop a new model of the universe, a better one. That being the heliocentric model, which is the sun is the center of the solar system and all the planets around it, including Earth, revolve around the sun. Now, why was this a better model? Well, it provided a much simpler explanation for the movement of the planets. Now, you still might be wondering why the heliocentric model was a better one. And I have an animation that I think will put things into perspective for you. So, as you can see from this animation, we took the insanity that was the geocentric model and turned it into something much more tangible and explainable through scientific practices. Perfect. So now that we've organized ourselves properly, let's take a look at each of the motions of Earth and see which one reigns supreme. So believe it or not, Earth, including us, moves in three distinct ways, each responsible for certain things we experience throughout our day, our year, and even our lifetime. And I have to note that the actual motions of Earth are based upon the heliocentric model. The first being the rotation of Earth or the spinning motion that you can see in the diagram below. The second motion is the revolution of Earth, which is the moving around or orbiting of an object, in this case, our Sun, which can be seen in the diagram below. 
And the third motion, Earth wobbling on its axis. Since Earth is not a perfect sphere, it wobbles on its 23 and a half degree axis. And if you take a look at this image, the top line represents that motion. It's very similar to when a top starts to slow down and wobble, like the animation below. Nice, so now we all know that we're riding on a space roller coaster on a mud rock. Bruh. But let's take a closer look at each of the motions of Earth and figure out what they do for us here on the surface of the Earth. Okay, so let's start with the rotation since we discussed it in our last video. So Earth rotates on its axis west to east one time each day. Earth's axis is an imaginary pole that runs through the center of the planet at a tilt of 23 and a half degrees. And this is what it would look like, folks. Okay, so a couple of rules of thumb for you. The period of rotation for Earth is 24 hours, or one day. And the rate of rotation is 15 degrees per hour, or 360 degrees per day. Now, some of you might be wondering, what would happen if Earth started to rotate faster? Or slower? Or maybe even stop? And you might be thinking, what effects would these have on our day-to-day -day lives? For instance, if the Earth started to spin slower, that means that the day and night would become longer. And if the Earth started to spin faster, that means that the day and night would become shorter. And let's just say, for instance, that the Earth just suddenly stopped rotating altogether. Well, I can tell you right now that we would all be in a world of trouble. The short explanation, we'd be goners. The slightly longer explanation, everything on Earth would be hurled in one direction at thousands of miles an hour. So unless you were underground or at a very high latitude, it wouldn't be looking good for you. Now, it's great if we all believe me when I say the Earth rotates, but it's always important that we back what we say in science with evidence. So the two major points of evidence that Earth rotates are as follows. The first is what's called the Coriolis effect. And this is the deflection or the curving of planetary winds, which is caused by Earth's rotation. So in our hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, winds tend to curve to the right. And in the southern hemisphere, the winds tend to curve to the left. And the second piece of evidence is what's called the Foucault pendulum. A pendulum never changes direction of its swing. But the Foucault pendulum appears to change direction of swing over the course of one day. And this is because Earth is rotating underneath that pendulum. So this is what it would look like, folks. Now, I know it's hard to imagine, but the actual pendulum itself is always swinging in the same direction. What's actually changing is that the Earth is rotating underneath it. Perfect. So now, not only do we know all about rotation, but we've got evidence to back it up. So let's move on and talk about Earth's second motion, revolution. So Earth revolves, or orbits, around the sun counterclockwise one time each year. The period of revolution is 365.25 days, which again is one year. And this causes what's called a leap year. So every four years, an extra day is added to the calendar. February 29th happens to be that day, which is the 366th day of the year to account for the extra quarter day in Earth's revolution. So the rate of revolution for Earth is one degree per day, or approximately 360 degrees per year. Now, the next thing we should be asking ourselves is, is Earth's orbit a perfect circle? And the short answer is no. The Earth has an elliptical or an oval-shaped orbit, 
meaning that Earth's distance from the sun changes over the course of the year. Now, this diagram represents that change. And this is important to know because guess what? Say what? We can and will calculate how elliptical orbits are later in this video. But first, let's back up our statement of revolution with some evidence. So, the evidence that we have to back this claim up is that the sun's apparent diameter, or its apparent size, changes throughout the year. Now, we give special names for when we are closest to the sun and furthest away from the sun. Now, aphelion is when we are furthest from the sun. This is when the apparent diameter of the sun is the smallest, and it just so happens to fall on July 4th, which is our summer. Now, perihelion is when we are closest to the sun. This is when the sun's diameter appears to be the largest, and it just so happens to fall on January 4th, right smack dab in the middle of winter. And here is an actual image of aphelion sun versus perihelion sun. And you can clearly see that the diameter of the aphelion sun is smaller than the perihelion. So, that means that we're actually furthest from the sun during our summer. And before anyone's head explodes, I'll explain why it's warmer, even though we're further from the sun, in a few minutes. But let's first look at a few more pieces of evidence as to Earth and its revolution. Now a second piece of evidence that Earth is revolving around the Sun is constellations. So different star constellations are actually visible from the Earth at different seasons of the year. And these constellations are commonly referred to as our astrological constellations. Now, a third piece of evidence is that we have seasons. And the seasons are based upon three different factors. The first being Earth's tilt. The second being Earth's revolution around the sun. And the third being that Earth's axis is always pointed towards Polaris. So that tilt doesn't change as we revolve. Sweet. Now no one can deny our revolution. And... It's time for the moment you've been waiting for. Time to do some practice problems on your own. As always, pause on each of the problems and solve. Okay, great work. So, let's backtrack a bit. I told you that I was going to explain to you that even though we're further away from the sun in the summer, it's warmer temperatures. So, eyes and ears up, folks. Now, the reason that we experience warmer temperatures in the summer, even though we're the furthest away from the sun, is because of our angle of insulation. And insulation just means the amount of energy that leaves the sun and reaches Earth. So in the summer, our angle of insulation is high, which means that we get more direct sunlight. And that means higher temperatures. And in the winter, our angle of insulation is low. So we get less direct insulation, and that means colder temperatures. Now, I'm sure there are some of us that are like, so yeah, mate. and that's okay, because I've got an example that I think is gonna be really helpful. So, I want you to go into your house, and I want you to try and find a light source, a flashlight, or a small light like this, okay? Now, the first thing I want you to do is lay your hand flat on a surface. And I want you to take that light and I want you to shine it directly above your hand. Okay? What do you feel? 
Now, I'm sure that most of us feel the warmth from the light, and it's probably pretty intense. And this represents a high angle of insulation or direct sunlight. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take that same light and move it over to the side, like so. So now what do you feel? Well, I'm sure that most of us feel that it's a bit cooler. And this is because this is a low angle of insulation or indirect sunlight. So here's a rule of thumb, folks. As the angle of insulation increases, the intensity of insulation increases. And as the intensity of insulation increases, the temperature increases. Now, folks, that's the bare bones of insulation. And there's a lot more information about it, which I've included in the presentation that goes along with this video. And if I were you, I would definitely check it out. Wah, this video is almost over, folks. But before we end it, we need to backtrack once more and talk about how the orbit of Earth isn't such a perfect circle. All right, so let's first understand what an orbit is. So an orbit is a path an object takes around another object. Now let's differentiate a circle orbit versus an elliptical one. So each planet in our solar system revolves around the sun at a slightly elliptical or eccentric orbit. Now a circle is a geometric figure constructed around a single point called the focus in which all possible diameters are equal. And an ellipse is a geometric shape constructed around two center points called foci, which is plural for focus, in which all diameters have different measurements. And this first image is a circle around a focus point, and the second shape is an ellipse, which is formed around two foci. Now, in the case of our elliptical orbit, the sun happens to be one of the foci points, so it's not actually at the center of our orbit. And the other point just happens to be an imaginary point in space. So, now that we've determined the difference between a circle orbit and an elliptical orbit, being the curious humans that we are, let's figure out how we can calculate just how elliptical every orbit is. Okay, so eccentricity is the measure of the amount of ovalness an ellipse has. And when we're calculating eccentricity, the equation is found on the front cover of our Earth Science Reference Table. Now, that formula happens to be eccentricity is equal to distance between foci divided by length of major axis. Now, the distance between foci is literally the measured value between the two foci. And the major axis is the largest possible diameter that can be drawn across an ellipse and passes through both of the foci. So I want you to look at this diagram. The line on the top is the distance between foci. And the line at the bottom is the length of the major axis. And that's good because those are the only two numbers that we need to calculate eccentricity. But let's take a look at what values we should be getting when we calculate for eccentricity. So eccentricity is always a number between 0.0, .0 and 1.0. It does not have units, and it's always rounded to the nearest thousandth place. So the closer the eccentricity is to 0.0, .0 the closer the ellipse is to being a perfect circle. The eccentricity of a perfect circle happens to be 0.0. .0. And the closer the eccentricity is to 1.0, the more elongated or flattened that ellipse has to be. Alright, so we're just about ready to calculate. I just want to make sure we all understand rounding to the thousandth place. So when we round to the thousandth place, we round the third number, as you can see where my cursor is. So, since the 8 is larger than 5, that must mean we need to round the 5 up. 
So our answer is 0 0.046. Now take a second and see if you can round to the thousandth on the second one. All right, go. So if you said 0.738, you were right. And that's because the fourth number is smaller than five. All right. Now we're ready to calculate one of these suckers. Now the first thing we always do when we do an equation in earth science is write that formula down. Eccentricity is equal to the distance between foci divided by the length of the major axis. Now the second step is we substitute the data into the equation with the correct units. So let's get our data using orbit A. First thing we're going to find is the distance between the foci. And it happens to be 5.7 centimeters. Great. Now let's get our length of our major axis. The length of our major axis happens to be 8.5 centimeters. Perfect. We have both numbers we need in order to calculate eccentricity. So let's plug those in. Eccentricity is equal to 5.7 centimeters divided by 8.5 centimeters. And guess what, folks? The easy part is upon us. Now all we do is divide, and our answer happens to be 0 0.6705. Now you'll notice that there is no units, and that's because we have like units, and like units cancel out. And some of you might have picked up on the fact that we haven't rounded to the thousandth yet. So in order to finish our answer, we round to the thousandth, and now we have a perfectly solved eccentricity. See? Super easy! And now, it's time for the moment you've been waiting. Time to try one on your own. So make sure to pause, follow the instructions on the slide, and calculate the eccentricity for the next orbit. Okay? Go. We've got some winners here, folks. One last thing to know before we go. In your Earth Science Reference Table on page 15, you're gonna find a handy dandy chart that gives you a ton of relevant information about each of the planets in our solar system, including the eccentricity of each of their orbits. See? So anytime you see a question about another planet or even our own, that's the first place you should look. And that's gonna do it for this video, folks. So as always, make sure to complete all your additional assignments and I'll see you on the next episode of Earth Science 2020.